everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today we're going to be talking about the big topic of book distribution, how book distribution works in traditional publishing. Specifically because it is such a broad and big topic, I'm splitting it into two separate videos. This one is all about bookstores, and I'll do a separate talk on libraries. First up, a disclaimer, I'm sharing as much as I know, as much as I've learned about traditional publishing and book distribution and bookstores, but there are inevitably going to be gaps in my own knowledge. I've learned this through my experience as being traditionally published, as well as talking to bookstores, people who work at bookstores, both Barnes & Noble and Indie, and just picking their brains and asking questions. Not everything I'm going to go over is common knowledge, but this is definitely an area that has fascinated me, so I've tried to find out as much as I can but inevitably there are going to be things that I don't know about yet or that I leave out. But this is your basic, inevitably long-winded primer on how book distribution works in traditional publishing when it comes to bookstores. So first off, this may be stating the incredibly obvious, but overwhelmingly bookstores primarily carry titles from so-called traditional publishers. Traditional publishers are publishing houses typically that offer an advance not always, but that have distribution chain with bookstores, libraries, etc. It is a publisher who pays you for the rights to publish your work, and they're going to physically print your book most of the time and get it out into the world. Some things are changing in terms of indie titles having carriage in bookstores, but my experiences are, of course, in traditional publishing, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on. One of the reasons traditional publishers have such a strong foothold in book distribution and bookstores is that they've been doing it for decades and decades and decades, and they have strong relationships with the big book distributors. And that's the thing, publishers themselves do not directly provide books to bookstores, places where you can buy books. They use distributors, middlemen, warehouses, and they basically have the inventory, and they then provide that stock to the places where books are sold. There are a lot of smaller distributors, but the major players in the distributor game, well, there used to be two for bookstores, Ingram and Baker and & Taylor, but Baker & Taylor recently announced that they are no longer going to be in the distribution business with bookstores, that they are solely going to focus on libraries. So Baker & Taylor will come up a lot in the library video, but really all that's left, the big player, is Ingram. So Ingram has warehouses across the United States so that they can cover regions and ship books to bookstores and get them there quickly. So they're giant warehouse spaces where they carry all of these books from all of these different publishers. And then the bookstores and libraries have ordering systems where they can place orders for books from Ingram or what have you, because there are some smaller distributors who also stock books and bookstores can order from them. But all of the major publishers overwhelmingly are going to be using Ingram now. So briefly, how do traditional publishers reach booksellers? Because a whole part of things is convincing bookstores to order copies of your books so that they are carried in the store. And traditional publishing is very well ingrained kind of in this business with bookstores and relationship with bookstores. So one way that they reach booksellers is publishers attend trade shows. There are trade shows for booksellers. The big one is the American Booksellers Association. So you may have heard of them, ABA. You'll hear of, ooh, ABA Midwinter or ABA Annual Conference. So that is the bookseller association the major ones, and they do have regional conferences as well as semi-annual conferences, and publishers attend these. They have booths where they're promoting their current and upcoming titles. The people who work for the publisher have relationships with people at the bookstores, the buyers at the bookstores. And this gets into sales teams, and that's the thing. There are entire departments at traditional publishers whose sole job is sales, convincing people to sell your book. There are people who work specifically with libraries and teachers, school and library markets, and then there are specific people, specific teams whose sole job is to convince bookstores to carry their titles. Typically, they're going to have a sales force across the country with regionally based reps who have relationships with all of the bookstores in a given region. Um, 
usually in these stores because Barnes and Noble is managed corporately, which put a pin in that, we're gonna talk about Barnes and Noble. And they basically have meetings with the bookstores, they bring ARCs to them, they give them e-ARCs from sites like Edelweiss and NetGalley, but Edelweiss specifically is heavily used by booksellers and librarians to evaluate copies of books so that they can place their orders of what they're going to carry in the store. To help with this, publishers put together seasonal catalogs which show, hey, these are all of our titles across all of our different categories coming out during this season and why you should buy them. They'll have pitches, they'll have comp titles so that booksellers have an idea of what they're similar to and how they might sell. They'll have key selling points. If you get an Edelweiss account, you can actually see all of this pitch language that is used and you can look at the catalogs that publishers send out to bookstores and libraries. And I've done that. I've set up an Edelweiss account so that I can look. It's, it's kind of weird to see how they pitch your book. And they also include in these catalogs, by the way, they let the bookstores know how much marketing they are going to do for a title so that the bookstore has a good idea. Ah, the publisher is going to be pushing this title, so if I stock it in my store, higher chance that copies are going to move from the shelf. And so bookstores then decide, they tell the sales force, usually approximately six months before a book comes out, how many copies they are going to place an order for and have in their store. And this is how the publishers determine demand for a title, real demand for a title, and determine their print run. So I do want to talk a little bit about print runs, just like a fun little FYI thing that I've learned. So publishers will state a print run uh, usually a year out from the time that the title's coming out because that's when the sales force starts doing their job. And by the way, this is why lead times are so long in publishing because they need usually a full year for the sales force to do their job, to get bookstores to agree to take on a certain number of copies, to do all of the marketing, etc. So at that point, nine months to a year out, they're gonna say the print one for this is 75,000 copies. And I'm here to tell you that's always a lie. <laughs> Possibly with the exception of like the biggest sellers in the industry, it's a lie. Typically your actual print run is going to be 60 to 70% lower or more than the stated print run. But these print runs that they announce give the sales force a tool and booksellers and so on an idea of how big the title is to the publisher, how much push they're putting behind it, how much money. And it's all kind of a PR tool. <laughs> for the sales team to get bookstores to place more orders. So then you won't actually know your print run until much closer to publication, three or four months out, and that real print run is typically reflective of how many bookstores and libraries and book boxes and all of that have actually agreed to take copies of your book, and that becomes your print run number, and the number against which you have to kind of evaluate sales and success and that's that's a whole thing. Okay, so let's talk about sales incentives. So how publishers get bookstores to take more copies of your book. So this is, it's like a dirty little secret, but it isn't really a secret. It is definitely something I learned about once I was kind of already in the mode of traditional publishing. And it was definitely a light bulb moment for me. I was like, this makes so much sense, but also makes me hate everything. So Certain publishers, usually the biggest publishers, have sales incentives for bookstores where they basically say, hey, 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 you love us, right? Um, if you take five of our titles, agree to stock three copies of these five titles, we're gonna throw in a sixth title for free. Now, when bookstores order titles, they're getting a wholesaler discount. They don't pay list price for the book, they get wholesaler discounts, and then, you know, sell it onto you, the consumer, so that there's a profit margin there. And the sales incentives basically get them extra stock at a cost savings. This is better for the bookstore because it can increase their profit margin, so it's very attractive to them. But it can mean, oh, the bookstores will then favor carrying more titles from certain publishers because it's more cost effective for them. And it is definitely the bigger publishers that can offer these sorts of incentives. The smaller publishers or even the smaller major publishers can't necessarily offer these sales incentives. It's all really interesting. <laughs> and then this brings me to returns. 
free returns. This is another really essential aspect of distribution and bookstores that is definitely worth knowing, including if you're indie, because this is going to potentially kind of come up if you're an indie author. I'm told if you go through Ingram Spark, you can select free returns, which makes it more likely that bookstores can stock you because it's all about reducing risk for the bookstore. Bookstores like free returns, which essentially means they get a refund for unsold copies of books. So let's say Barnes & Noble takes five copies of your book for every Barnes & Noble in the country, or let's say local Indie Joe takes three copies of your book. And in six months, the Barnes & Noble have only sold at any given store three of those copies, which leaves two left over for every store, and the indie could only sell two of the three. Well, that those extra books, they get to return them to the publisher and the publisher will refund them the cost of those books. So essentially, bookstores don't have to eat the cost of books they can't sell. The publishers take on that burden. And by the way, this trickles down to you as the author, there's something called a reserve against returns. So when you're looking at your royalty statements, often for the first couple of years of publication, or for a certain number of royalty statements, your publisher holds a reserve of profit against returns. So that amount of money that is theoretically been made off your book because they've sold them wholesale or to bookstores doesn't count toward you earning out because they anticipate X percentage of your books are going to be returned to them and they're gonna to have to refund the bookseller. So that's a whole thing that goes on. <laughs> the reason this is very important to know about is this can be kind of the sticking point between being traditionally published with a large, more established publisher and a smaller publisher that maybe is newer or just doesn't have the cash flow to support free returns. And thus what can often happen with these is they'll say to the bookstore, any copies you buy are non-returnable. And so that means that the bookstore either sometimes will opt not to carry any titles from a publisher because it's just too high of a risk if they can't move the copies or they're going to take far less if they do take them at all. And where I've seen this come up with friends of mine is, to me, I'm published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, which is a, it's one of the majors, but it's not big five, but they're long established and of course they do free returns with bookstores. So never any problem for me to do an event with a bookstore. They have plenty of copies of my book. They're able to order, let's say I'm doing an event, they'll order 20 copies to have in store and it represents no risk for them because if they don't sell, they can return them to my publisher. But I know people who have been published with smaller publishers, still traditionally published, where that isn't the case. They try to set up a bookstore event and they're told by the bookstore they have to pay for their own stock, supply their own stock, because the bookstore will not order 20 copies of their book because if they only sell five of them, they're stuck with 15 copies and that's a waste of money to them. So it's it can be good to kind of ask up front before you're getting a publishing deal, talk to your agent, talk to the publisher, and you might not want to sell to publishers that don't kind of have those terms because it can definitely impact your experience as an author. You're likely to be carried in fewer bookstores, if at all, and you can encounter problems where you do have to pay for your own stock just to do a signing event. So there, there's definitely a variance of experiences across traditional publishing. So next I want to talk about the power of Barnes & Noble or the juggernaut of Barnes & Noble. And of course, Everything I'm talking about is really the US based industry. And I can't really speak to foreign markets. It's easiest just to focus on the focus on the traditional published US book market. And here, all we have left in terms of major bookstore chains is Barnes and Noble. They're the last one standing though, a couple of markets do have books a million. And me, your elder, I just remember when there were so many bookstore chains. There, there was B. Dalton Books and Borders, of course, Barnes & Noble. You just had more choices. There's more than I can't even think of, but my region, B. Dalton was like the major in competition with Borders and Barnes and & Noble. And then they all went away, except for Barnes & Noble. And we've had this situation for a while where Barnes & Noble has an inordinate amount of power. I mean, between Barnes & Noble and Amazon, there are a lot of concerning things facing the book industry, though happily in the last couple of years, we've seen a real resurgence of indie bookstores, which is a good thing. But Barnes & Noble has a lot of power because they are the major national chain book store. 
So this brings me into like the next section of things to know about bookstores, fascinating things to know about bookstores when it comes to Barnes & Noble and how it really impacts the bookstore market. So Barnes & Noble has a ton of power because if a book isn't stocked in Barnes & Noble, if Barnes & Noble declines to carry a title, it can seriously impact the life of that book, the sales it can get, etc. And so publishers strive to do whatever they can do to get books picked up by Barnes & Noble because it does happen sometimes that Barnes & Noble declines to carry a title. Bookstore carriage is not guaranteed when you are traditionally published. It is statistically way, 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 way more likely than if you're doing indie or even if you're with a legitimate small publisher, but it's not guaranteed. You can be with a big five publisher and Barnes & Noble can decline to stock your title, but publishers do everything in their power to avoid this. And some things that Barnes & Noble therefore has some sway over, real power over, is your title and your cover. Barnes & Noble can say, oh, we don't like that title, or oh, we don't like that cover. And in order to get it stocked in Barnes & Noble, your publisher has to change it if they want uh, to be in Barnes & Noble. So those things can definitely happen. And then the size of your Barnes & Noble order can make a huge difference with like your print run and like the health of, of your book and kind of people being able to go into any store around the country and buy your book. It really varies widely. You probably might want to hear some averages though, since you're here to learn everything about books or distribution. So generally, if you get one to two copies of your book stocked in a bookstore at any given time upon release up into a certain point, which we're going to talk about weaning, that's another thing that not everyone knows about bookstores and uh, traditional publishing, publishing in general, but if you get one to two copies on shelves at most bookstores, you're doing very, very well. You're gonna have a healthy print run, good chance at selling, especially if the booksellers are hand selling your book. You have more than that, it's, pr it's a pretty big deal. But just to warn you that many traditionally published books only get one copy stocked at any given time in bookstores. A lot of authors, I think, end up being disappointed because of course we, we see the dream, we hope for the dream, where you go into a bookstore and oh my gosh, they have 10 copies of your book and they sell them. Uh, and that's just not the norm. A lot of titles just get one book stocked in any given bookstore. And that can still be a very healthy print run. And of course, if they sell that copy, they order another to replace it on the shelves. But it's more rare to have three, four, five copies at any given time on the shelves. They do those for the books that are really going to be moving because generally because of the warehouse system with the distributors, they have a lot of them around the country. They're strategically placed. And I, an indie bookseller friend of mine told me they can get a title 24 hours, max 48 in a lot of cases. So if you're looking to order a title, you don't always have to go with Amazon for their prime shipping. Your local indie can get that book just as fast, if not faster. Which brings me to things publishers pay Barnes & Noble for. So this might blow some minds. This was definitely a learning moment for me. I was like, wow. Cool. Also, I hate everything. So publishers pay Barnes & Noble to put books on display. Anytime you see a book on a display table, like summer favorites, new releases, YA series to read, whatever, or end caps. So those are the caps at the end of the aisles of bookstores, usually themed, like recommended, blah, blah, blah. 90% of the time, publishers have paid for that positioning. They're paying, I, I don't know if it's by week or by month, but they pay to have your book featured on the table. They'll pay for the 20% off promo and getting it on the table. Of course, there are cases where employees do their own recommended things, usually on an end cap. And as far as I know, publishers aren't paying for that. So that would represent the exception. But by and large, if you're getting that focus at a Barnes and Noble store, it's because your publisher paid for it. Similarly, if you see a special display, like they'll do these really fancy like custom cardboard displays for new releases, 100% those are being paid for. And kind of in the tier of paid marketing from your publisher, that's like at the top. If you get a special display at Barnes & Noble, you're probably a lead title and your publisher is shelling out a lot of money. It's more like mid-level to get paid display on tables or on end caps. And then if you're not uh, in the top of the pile marketing wise, they're not gonna do any extra payment and you're just gonna be on the shelf like normal. Now there are things that are newer, like the Barnes and Noble book club that I've noticed. And I want to say they're doing a book box. I know uh, Indigo does in Canada. I don't know if those are paid, 
but I highly suspect those are paid for by the publisher. Don't quote me on that. I haven't had the guts to ask, and I certainly haven't had that myself, which is part, a lot of this I've learned through my own experiences. So I found out that they paid for the display tables because my publisher paid for me to be on a display table. And I was like, also, thank you, publisher. You're great. Um, but this should both, I mean, slightly horrify you, but it should be elucidating, but also maybe a relief. So if you're an author and you are traditionally published and you're just really disappointed that you're not on display tables or end caps, it's not your fault. It's not because you aren't good enough and the bookstore doesn't love you. Often it's pay to play. It's that your publisher hasn't paid for that privilege. So I also strongly suspect this is the case with Target as well. I suspect some of the highlighted titles at Target might be paid for as well, but I know way less about Target because Hair Girl was definitely not in Target. <laughs> Need to learn more about that. Um, hopefully by getting into Target someday. Now, I can say as far as I know and could confirm with my friends who work at indie booksellers, indie stores are not paid. They, the bookstores don't essentially give them kickbacks for this preferred placement. So anytime you're seeing a curated display or table in an indie, that is genuine 100% the indie bookstore deciding to support that book and that author and putting it out there. The one exception to that in indie stores will be Indie Next picks, but that's not paid either. Indie Next is a program put together by indie booksellers where they're sent advanced copies of books and then every season they pick uh, a certain number of books that are like ones to watch. So they're Indie Next picks and those are highlighted in the store. That's not paid for though. That's just kind of a extra thing that can happen with bookstores, which I guess, again, is another thing to know about traditional publishing. This is a possibility where you can be an Indie Next pick, which can really help your visibility and your sales across the country at Indie bookstores. Okay, so lastly, with bookstores, I want to talk about shelf life and weeding kind of going into this as paperbacks. This is one that a lot of people don't know about or don't kind of consciously realize or recognize. Once you're in there and you really think about it, both as a consumer and as an author, it totally makes sense. But the sad reality is, most books simply don't remain on the shelves that long. That's because there are constantly new books coming out and bookstores need to stock the shelves with titles that are going to move, things that they can sell. It's a business. The huge hit books will always have shelf space at the bookstore. And that's why I think a lot of us don't realize or take for granted that your book will always be physically on the shelves at a bookstore because we as consumers go to stores years over years and we always see the Hunger Games or Harry Potter or Red Queen or John Green, because of course we do. These are perennial sellers. A bookstore can always move a copy of these books, and so they always keep them in stock. But the vast majority of titles, that's simply not the case. I recently posted a video about the midlist, which you can watch if you want to hear more about this. The midlist falls in the middle. It's steady books that sell well enough, but they're not evergreen best-selling titles. And so these are exactly the kind of books that you're going to see churn on the shelves, though some midlist favorites will have longer shelf life because they are midlist favorites. But all that stuff below the midlist, when a book comes out and it just doesn't perform, it's going to be weeded from the shelves. This is a practice that happens both at bookstores and libraries, but focusing specifically on bookstores, it's literally just about can the bookstore move the stock? There can be cases where a bookstore stocks even just one copy of a book and it doesn't sell in eight months. And so they just can't keep it on the shelves anymore. The book just didn't sell to their local book buying population and so they return it to the publisher. Some bookstores are going to start the weeding process earlier than others. It depends on the size of the store, the appeal of the title, whether they want to give it more time, and the volume of more titles coming out. It can also be genre and publisher specific. Certain genres have much higher turnover than others, meaning lots of titles continually coming out, like YA fantasy would definitely be one of those. But you know, outside of way, like historical novels, there just aren't as many as of them. So there might be a longer shelf life of, of books. It's, it's physically about shelf space. And then with specific publishers, as I mentioned, you know, those incentive programs, you know, to get XYZ number of Harper Penguin Random House titles on the shelves. 
Bookstores can't have only HarperCollins books or only Penguin Random House books. They want to have a variety of titles from a variety of different publishers. So very often you'll see, I've noticed this specifically with Harper Teen. Harper Teen publishes a lot of books. I've noticed at best the shelf life on a Harper Teen title is going to be six months. It's often shorter though. They release so many titles that it's almost like the bookstores have a certain quota for Harper Teen books. And when new ones come out, they have to shuffle the old ones off the shelf. So you might see higher turnover if your publisher publishes way more titles in a specific genre or space. The titles will stay for sale on the websites of the bookstores. They're still buyable through the Indie you can, or Barnes & Noble. You can always order them and have them shipped to you or pick up in store. But when you're weeded, you're no longer sitting on the shelves for any random person to come into the bookstore to browse and buy. So for example, I'm definitely not on bookshelves anymore at most bookstores. It's been, oh gosh, a year and three or four months since my book came out. Honestly, I'd be shocked if it was still on shelves six months after my book came out. Though I think some bookstores did keep me for like eight months, thank you. But the shelf life of my debut novel has passed at most bookstores. But I have a new book coming out in February of 2020 and a paperback release scheduled for the same day. Paperback release of that first book. The reason publishers do this, I also have a video on paperbacks you can watch if you want to learn more from there and I'll link to it down below. The reason publishers release the paperbacks of previous titles either really really close to the release of a new hardcover or the same day is to get back on the shelf space. If the hardcover has been weeded and no longer has a home on the shelves, the paperback is a new release, a new opportunity for people to buy it, and the bookstore will stock the paperback alongside your new hardcover. So that is another chance at shelf life. So my new paperback hopefully will be on the shelves for six to eight months alongside my hardcover. It's a cycle, it's a life cycle, um, and that's just kind of a reality of, of books. And really I just want to close on kind of the fickleness of bookstores in the industry, meaning just as a caution that when you're traditionally published or published at all, you're definitely going to end up having feelings in bookstores. If you're lucky, you're carried in every bookstore imaginable and you can walk into any bookstore and see your book and it's a great feeling. But it also happens often enough, especially if you're not a big splashy breakout title, that you're gonna go to a bookstore and your book isn't there. And it's always kind of a bummer. And then once the shelf life of your book passes and you've been weeded, you're not gonna see it anymore. And it's a bummer again, but at least you're in the same boat as a lot of other titles. But it's just to let you know that the book selling in bookstores, it's a very cyclical business. Nothing lasts forever unless you're a huge, huge seller, but that's why it's always write more books. You want to try to get more deals. As you develop a backlist, especially if you do have a more successful book, you increase your chances of being worth some shelf space so that they carry your books longer term, you're weeded less often, or just, you know, indies liking you or booksellers of Barnes & Noble liking you. Hand selling can do a lot for a book, and if a book performs very, very well in a specific bookstore or location, they're more likely to stock your book because they know their local readers might potentially like this. So. It's always an interesting thing. Oh, and also very, very important for you to establish a relationship with your local bookstore. Don't just think that they're these weird, you know, far away corporate or, you know, indie entities who don't want to talk to you. I know it's scary. I have been terrified every time I've done it, but introducing yourself at your local bookstore, your indie or your Barnes and Noble is always valuable because they're more likely to stock your book, including long-term if you're local and they like you, plus you can do events there. So that is the nutshell of how bookstore distribution works for traditional publishing generally. And just some of the cool things to know, secrets, disappointments, just the nuts and bolts of how it works for traditional publishing. As I said, I'm always learning more things, so maybe I'll learn even more about bookstores and have more to tell you, but this should work as a primer for anyone who's interested in traditional publishing and getting their books in bookstores and kind of how it works. Let me know down below in the comments any questions you have about this whole thing. It's a big topic. If I don't know something, I'll try to ask a bookseller friend and find out for you. I've definitely learned just by asking questions, by seeing something and asking either my publisher or friends like 
what's this about? How does it work? And I've, I've learned a lot about the business. Give this video a thumbs up if you like it. I will make more in-depth videos about the nitty gritty of traditional publishing. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that. I post new videos two to three times a week. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, guys, happy writing.